Uh, welcome everyone to the latest installment of Cactus Research Into Action webinar series. Um, my name is Sukjin Justin Hong, and I'm a senior associate on CADCA's evaluation and research team. If you haven't previously participated in one of our webinars, the purpose of this webinar series is to introduce coalition members and substance misuse preventionists to current and relevant research being conducted in the substance use and community coalition fields. In today's webinar, we're delighted to have Dr. Albert Terillion, Dr. Grant Baldwin, and Ms. Marilee Fowler. So Dr. Grant Baldwin here, is the uh, director of the Division of Overdose Prevention at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. And uh, we also have Dr. Albert Terillion from CADCA. Uh, so Dr. Albert Terillion is the deputy director of the evaluation and research team here at CADCA. And finally, we have Ms. Uh, Marilee Fowler. And Ms. Marilee Fowler is the executive director of the award-winning Matt Forrest uh, and also she is uh, the executive director of Community Counts as well. All right, and you can go ahead and take over whenever, Dr. Baldwin. Great, thank you so much, Justin. Great to be part of this conversation with all of you. Wonderful to see so many people on, on the webinar. I look forward to the discussion that will follow. So my task is a, a, is a couple fold. I'm gonna set, set the stage for the conversation, talk about the risks and the burden of fentanyl. Albert will follow and introduce uh, the practical theorists that CADCA is assumed to release. And then Mara Lee will end really with a pragmatic example of what's being done on the ground in our DFC coalitions across the country. Um, and as Justin indicated, please feel free to add your questions as they come up um, into the Q&A box or uh, chat with us directly. So here's the burden, the drug overdose burden in 2021. Unfortunately, we've lost 106,000, basically 107,000 of our fellow Americans in 2021. There are a number of reasons for that. The principal among them, of course, is illicitly manufactured fentanyl. But the COVID-19 pandemic deaths, drug overdose deaths, really accelerated during the pandemic, although they were increasing before. And I'll show you those data in just a second. One of the other major drivers is the co-involvement of illicitly manufactured fentanyl in other drug overdose deaths. So later on, I'll show you data on cocaine and um, psychostimulants with abuse potential, principally methamphetamines. But the data on this slide is from a vital signs a few years ago. The graph on the left shows increasing deaths with co-involvement from 2013 onward in every drug class. The graph on the right shows that deaths from prescription opioids and heroin actually decreased with, without co-involvement, but methamphetamines increased. So we have a drug overdose crisis driven principally by illicitly manufactured fentanyl, but we also have a methamphetamine crisis on top of that. So this is the, although the provisional data through uh, June of this year is about to re uh, be released, this is the latest provisional drug overdose de death data that we have. So the graph on the left is overall drug overdose deaths, you see they've increased 37% um, alone since the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020, um, and deaths from synthetic opioids excluding methadone, again, the class of drugs that includes fentanyl, increased uh, a stunning 74% since the beginning of the pandemic. The other point I want to make about this, uh, about these graphs is note the trends were increasing prior to the pandemic. So Drug overdose deaths, although they went down very slightly in 2018, um, it went up again in 2019. So um, it wasn't just the pandemic that was driving the increase. In fact, it was the illicitly manufactured fentanyl that was the principal driver. In addition to taking sort of the more proximal view, I think it's really important to take a long view of drug overdose deaths over time. So this is a graphic that looks at historical trends from 1999 to 2021. Um, you see that drug overdose deaths have increased sixfold. That's the purple line. Opioid overdose deaths, that's the royal blue line, increased tenfold. Prescription overdose deaths, almost fivefold. But note that synthetic opioids, excluding methadone, they increased 97% or 97fold, excuse me. That's the light blue line. And deaths from psychostimulants with abuse potential, that's the um, orange line, increased 59fold. Just a remarkable trend line over time. So again, juxtapose the 107,000 deaths that we saw in 2021 
to the 16,000 that we lost in 1999. I also wanted to show sort of the cumulative number of deaths over time and talk. I'm sure you've heard in the past about the waves of the opioid overdose crisis. So the first wave being prescription opioid deaths between 1999 and around 2009, where annual deaths increased around 2,000 deaths per year. The second wave beginning in 2010 through around 2013, we saw a remarkable increase in, in heroin-related deaths, where those deaths Deaths overall increased about 1,500 deaths per year, but then really a huge increase um, uh, in deaths associated with synthetic opioids excluding methadone beginning in 2013. So between 2013 and 2019, we saw an annual average increase in deaths of around 4,000, but just in the last two years, those deaths have increased 18,000 per year. So it took us nine years to reach 250,000 deaths six years to reach 500, an additional four years on top of that to reach 750,000. And then it's really hard to say, but just three years in total, we've now had over a million Americans who've lost their life to a drug overdose since 1999. I wanted, of course, to look very specifically at deaths among youth and young adults. So we've lost 87,000 people aged 5 to 24 since 1999, including Remarkably, almost 30,000 in the last five years alone, drug overdose deaths have increased sixfold. Drug overdose deaths have actually doubled um, among 15 to 19 year olds between 2019 and 2021. And drug overdose deaths have increased one and a half fold or almost one and a half fold for persons aged 20 to 24. I should note that 85% of those deaths. Um, in 2020 involved an opioid. And again, the narrative here is really fentanyl is the driver. So is anyone immune? And the short answer is really no. Every state in our union has seen an increase in drug overdose deaths in just between 2019 and 2021. So all 50 states saw an increase. West Virginia had the highest rate at both time points in, in 2019 and 2021. 14 states had an over 75% increase in their death rate and 40 states increased over 25%. Five states had death rates over 35 per 100,000 in, in 2019, and 21 states, so a six-fold increase, had death rates over that same number in 2021. Again, for the purposes of context, let's juxtapose where we are now to where we were before. So in 1999, the U.S. drug overdose death rate was 6.1 per 100,000, and the overall rate now is 32.7 per 100,000. So here I wanna start looking at issues of co-involvement. So deaths from cocaine involved deaths have increased both with and without opioids uh, in recent years. So cocaine involved deaths increased from, with opioids increased from 57% to 79% in 2021 and cocaine involved deaths with synthetic opioids increased from just 5% in 2013 to 74% in 2021. So those cocaine involved deaths with uh, synthetic opioids increased a remarkable 7,300% in that time period. So it's really, uh, when you think about cocaine involved deaths, it's really synthetic opioids that are driving the increase. Um, a little bit slightly different narrative when you think about psychostimulants with abuse potential, again, principally methamphetamines here, those deaths with opioids increased 34% um, in 2013 to 66% in 2021. And with synthetic opioids, they increased from 4% in 2013 to 58% in 2021. So again, psychostimulant deaths with synthetic opioids increased from approximately 40 um, to uh, since 2013, from 40 to almost 19,000, a remarkable increase. One of the other um, pieces of information we wanted to share with you is there's widening disparities. So deaths among um, uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives have always been elevated, but they've the, that disparity has increased. But also deaths among non-Hispanic Blacks have increased in the last few years and now have overtaken non-Hispanic whites um, as, uh, as a higher drug overdose death rate. So the issue around health disparities which you all know well, is a critical issue that we need to continue to invest in and attend to. So I, I frequently put this slide in my slide deck. This is sort of the elephant in the room slide. So 67% of all drug overdose deaths and 89% of opioid-involved deaths 
include synthetic opioids excluding methadone. Again, the narrative here is that fentanyl is the issue that we need to attend to. So why is fentanyl in our and the drug supply so consequential to us? Why do we need to be worried about it? So here's the classic continuum of drug use from no use to initiation and experimental use, occasional or social use, more regular use, use that qualifies for being um, problematic, and then ultimately developing a use disorder. The risk of a uh, of a fatal drug overdose is elevated with any with any use of fentanyl, given its potency, lethality, and really the variability in the illicit supply. And I have some slides that will follow that sort of hammer home that point more explicitly. Again, historically, the risk for both a fatal and non-fatal overdose increased as frequency of use grew. But of course, in an environment that's rife with fentanyl, risk of death is elevated upon initiation and really at every point across this continuum. And increases in deaths among youth and young adults, as well as increases in polydrug deaths involve fent involving fentanyl in all, in all age groups are really two markers of that elevated risk. So this slide really hammers home the point of the potency of fentanyl. I'm sure you've heard that um, fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. I found this graphic that was uh, initially posted in the Washington Post post that really drives home this point. So when you think about morphine, um, hydrocodone is about the equivalent potency, oxycodone is about 1.5 times, methadone three times, and heroin between two and five times. But this graphic showcases that you achieve the, the potency. So the amount of drug that's required to achieve the uh, effect sought, um, a significantly smaller amount of drug is required to get that effect. The other point I wanted to make on this slide is that fentanyl is also faster acting, which means, especially when it's injected, so that so central nervous system depression can occur really rapidly and really underscores the need. And I think you'll hear this both from Albert and from Mary Lee, the importance of having naloxone readily available across our communities to reverse an overdose should um, an overdose occur because the risk of death, because your ability to act um, and reverse an overdose is so time limited in an environment uh, rife with fentanyl. This is a DEA graphic that I really like. This is uh, two milligrams of fentanyl. It's the, really the potentially lethal dose for most people. Uh, of course, that depends on person's um, body size, their tolerance, and their past usage. But you can see it's really a, a significantly small amount of fentanyl that's required that's potentially uh, lethal to our youth and young adults, and really anyone for that matter. So counterfeit pills is also part of the story, and I think you'll hear more from both Albert and Mary Lee on this issue as well. This is, a, I think, some wonderful graphics that the DE has that juxtaposes what a um, real, in this case, oxycodone, Adderall, and Xanax pill look like, and one that's laced with fentanyl. So you can see that they're visibly to the average eye, almost identical. So when you think of Adderall, which of course is a prescription stimulant used to treat attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, or Xanax, or uh, Prazolam, as it's also known, is used to treat anxiety and panic disorders. Um, they those those pills literally are almost identical to one another. So to the um, average user, uh, they're almost indistinguishable. So social media platforms like Instagram and Snapchat, where uh, drug traffickers um, frequently traffic um, their products, a user could be uh, understandably, um, you know, sort of mistake uh, a counterfeit pill for. Um, a prescription pill, as in the case of the graphics uh, on the top with oxycodone and Adderall, and on the left with Xanax. The other issue, and when you think about the illicit supply that, and I, I like this framing of chocolate chipping, is when our drug tra the drug traffickers are mixing fentanyl um, into the drug supply, it's laced in with other products like uh, caffeine as a specific example. The amount of fentanyl that's mixed across counterfeit pills can vary quite dramatically. So if you think about the mixing occurs that occurs, and by the way, this is done in, in sort of consumer-based um, like coffee grinders, if you will. So it's, in, it's incredibly crude when it's done, but when it's ultimately tableted, those tablets can have 
distinctly different amounts of fentanyl in them from one pill to another. And I think the graphic on the bottom really drives that point home uh, really extensively. And if you think about chocolate chip cookies, which many of us enjoy, the amount of chocolate chips um, can vary dramatically from cookie to cookie. And that's the case when you think of counterfeit pills as well. So the amount of fentanyl in a pill can vary dramatically from one pill to another. I wanted to end by making some points about sort of fentanyl seizures. This is data from the National Forensic Laboratory Information System, or NIFLIS, that collects um, um, drug data from uh, drug cases submitted to federal, state, and local forensic laboratories. You can see, much like the trends in drug overdose deaths, they market increase uh, since 2013 in fentanyl seizures. So there were 1.3 million drug reports in 2021, including 154,000 that involved fentanyl. This is another, um, this is from a peer-reviewed study that uses HIDA data or data from seizures from high-intensity drug trafficking areas, shows both an increase over time in fentanyl seizures, but really juxtaposes increases in um, uh, powder seizures at, versus pill seizures. So fentanyl-containing powder se seizures increased six, 262%. Pill seizures increased a remarkable 834%. And over 25% of illicit fentanyl seizures were in pill form at the end of quarter four in 2021. A remarkable number of pills were seized. So again, the pills, the seizures increase in those quarters over time from 42,202 in Q1 of 2018 to 2,089,000 um, in the end of 2021, a 4,850% increase. So before turning it over to Albert, I wanted to make these final um, six points and the about fentanyl and why we've seen the trends that we're seeing. It's easier and cheaper to produce. Obviously, it's made in a lab without the need for plant-derived products, such as the poppy plant. Pre pre precursor chemicals like NPP and ANPP are widely available in China and India that uh, drug traffickers use to make these products. It's sought after because of potency that you saw in some of my earlier slides. And we've seen a dramatic increase, whereas fentanyl deaths or fentanyl use was more likely restricted to the Northeast and the Midwest early on, we've seen, as you saw on the those um, state bubble charts, a wide swath, but really everywhere in the United States has seen an increase in fentanyl deaths. It's compact. Um, you saw that in that potency slide and um, less detectable. So it's easy to transport in small batches via the mail and package delivery companies. And of course, it generates astronomical um, profits for drug traffickers. One data point that I saw is that it's about 20 times the profit that you could get from heroin. It's a little bit dated, but you can make, and the, at the time, I believe this is 2017 data, a kilogram of heroin would generate a profit of around $80,000 for heroin. That same kilogram of fentanyl, when it's cut into 16 to 24 uh, kilograms of other street product, generates anywhere between $1.6 and $1.9 million. So that was me setting the stage with the trends in fentanyl-related deaths. With that, let me turn it over to Albert to talk about the fentanyl practical theorist. Albert? Uh, thank you, Dr. Baldwin. Everyone, I'm gonna get to my slides here real quick. Uh, before I uh, proceed with the next part of the uh, presentation, really my hat's off to Dr. Baldwin and the entire team uh, at the Injury Center with the CDC. I think that uh, of all the work that I've seen from the CDC, the Injury Center uh, shines because not only of their ability to bring the data out to make it really uh, understandable and make it very relevant to the problem, uh, but uh, in the work that we've done with them uh, in this practical theorist. All the data you've seen in Dr. Baldwin's presentation, a lot of it is within the practical theorist. I'm not going to repeat that, uh, but I also uh, want to make sure that people don't feel uh, too overwhelmed by the problem. And this is one of the things that we run into when we see the dire situation uh, is laid out before us by Dr. Baldwin. This is a very scary problem for us. So what we try to do is to bring together information with the help of the CDC that would not only bring that uh, information forward, but also to look at 
what the story is from the beginning to get a handle on an understanding of this problem. Uh, and then what are some solutions? What are some things that coalitions can do uh, in the prevention world? And we'll get into that a little bit later on. Uh, before I uh, move into that part of it, first, the title of the new practical theorist, and this is number 13, is Why Fentanyl and Why Now? And uh, before we uh, uh, start by thinking that why have it why have we taken so long to uh, get to this uh, substance, I would like to remind everyone that uh, we do a uh, practical se uh, theorist uh, series uh, ongoing, very substantial publications that we started in 2018. There were some before that, but th this is a completely different animal. Uh, we look at at least 200 different articles. It is research laden. Uh, the most up-to-date information from our federal partners and uh, like the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the CDC gave us the most recent up-to-date data from 2021. Uh, this is not dated at all. It's, it's, it's fresh, it's crisp, and it's, it should be very helpful to coalitions across the country. Uh, and the most important part is uh, the practical theorists seek to uh, respond to uh, very uh, relevant and up-to-date uh, uh, some of you will recall that this is not the first time we've looked at opioids. Uh, we did a practical theorist in 2017, which uh, looked at opioids top to bottom uh, from the history to what we have now. Uh, the the uh, practical theorist series continued in 2018 with a, uh, a, 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 an edition on vaping, uh, one addressing uh, cannabis. In 2022, we do have uh, fentanyl, why fentanyl, why now? And that's what we'll be talking about. Uh, 2022, later on, we have one that we're writing on methamphetamines. Dr. Baldwin mentioned the issue of methamphetamines, the issue of polyuse, and how sometimes these substances have to be considered together. Uh, we'll mention uh, a, a part of this in the methamphetamines uh, practical theorist as well. And then after that, this has been a busy year, we are going to be looking at uh, youth alcohol use uh, with our partnership for the National Institutes on Alcohol, National Institute on Alcohol Abuse uh, um, the NIAAA. All right. Uh, fentanyl. Why? Why now? It does build on the opioid practical theorist. It does create that narrative. Uh, it does help differentiate fentanyl. How is it different from these opioids? How is it alike? When was it created? And why is this information needed? And then next, we're going to last, we're going to get to community solutions for community, community problem. Uh, what can we do? Um, it's very easy to be overwhelmed by what Dr. Baldwin presented. Uh, this is a dire problem. It is uh, stark. Uh, we've seen the effects of opioids in the past, and this is a graphic from uh, that uh, practical theorist number 10 on opioids. Uh, we see fentanyl as a part of uh, the graphic here and how it was presented. Uh, but when we see the numbers that went from the issue of this practical theorist in 2018, to now, and as Dr. Baldwin pointed out, we had to do uh, one specifically dedicated uh, to fentanyl. Another graphic from that, uh, uh, from that practical theorist, uh, number 10, uh, was on the continuum of care and what our work can look like, uh, specifically uh, the difference between the work of coalitions prevention and uh, what uh, treatment and what long-term treatment looks like uh, this is not a uh, discrete uh, amount of work, and we're going to find uh, with this practical theorist and in this presentation that we have to work across this continuum uh, to use information, to share information, and to head off this uh, pandemic. Uh, when we look at the history of opioids, uh, we can go back uh, centuries, but for fentanyl, we can go back to 1963, and we do bring this out. Uh, we progressed uh, steadily through the pharmaceutical uh, versions of fentanyl and why they were created and what the purpose was uh, on through uh, the different uh, results of uh, misuse. Uh, but then what happened uh, in this uh, recent decade uh, through uh, the illicit manufacture of fentanyls, um, these uh, crudely manufactured uh, substances uh, with a, a chemical expertise and a marketing uh, savvy that really has uh, shaken, our, shaken our country to its core. Uh, as Dr. Uh, Baldwin mentioned, uh, the deaths uh, in 2021 
uh, exceeded 100,000. And as he mentioned, uh, these are due to fentanyl. And this timeline is, is brought out within that practical theorist. Uh, the real issue, uh, those uh, illicitly manufactured uh, substances, uh, and there's not one recipe, there's several, um, that they can tweak the chemicals, they can tweak the mixtures, uh, but still create a very powerful uh, 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 opioid. And there are a lot of ways by which these opioids are referred uh, at the street level. You know, we call these uh, the street names, but we should also be clear, again, as Dr. Uh, uh, Baldwin mentioned, that uh, fentanyl will show up in other substances. The labs that may be marketing methamphetamines will drop uh, fentanyl into methamphetamines because uh, it's what they think the market wants and it increases the potency of their uh, substance and will attract attention, but also will increase fatalities. Um, incidental and accidental uh, polyuse is what we're talking about. Methamphetamines, cocaine, and other opioids. This is how we're going to experience it in our communities. It is not a simple uh, one substance, one issue problem. It is a very, um, uh, it is a very complicated problem. Uh, laboratories in different locations uh, uh, bring some chemicals or make these chemicals and they're brought into our country and they're dropped in community by community. And that's where you'll see uh, mortality uh, and, it, and it spikes and it's uh, very hard to, uh, to prevent. We're gonna talk about what that prevention can look like. And then we can talk about uh, what some steps uh, can look like in uh, a coordination between uh, treatment and uh, prevention. Uh, if we look at uh, the increased incidence of overdoses, uh, we're looking at uh, what it means for us. We're looking at uh, uh, not only the presence of, of uh, naloxone in different uh, communities, but also recognizing those substances that are being used, looking at what their appearance is, uh, how they show up, and then sharing that information across uh, those different sectors. Uh, increasing opportunities for prevention to work with treatment, uh, to look at these, these uh, drops as they happen with our communities, uh, getting uh, the word out on what is happening in terms of, of use and misuse, and getting some alerts so that we can head off uh, and give some warnings about what's out there and just how dangerous some of these substances are. Uh, an example of, of how that coordination can actually happen. And this is what we found uh, in the research. Another thing that we found uh, that we included within uh, the practical theorists are those who are at risk. Uh, we have a lot of, of marginalized persons, uh, people that are set apart by racial, ethnic, uh, uh, social, uh, or racial, ethnic, or sexual identities, uh, gender minority groups, non-speaking uh, populations, uh, uh, little uh, economic stability, and uh, those who may be experiencing uh, problems in their lives. Um, if they're looking at homelessness, uh, mental health conditions, a record or a history of an incarceration. Um, we know that uh, adverse childhood experiences can, can lead to later problems. Uh, and uh, these are the people that are at risk. And we have to understand first and foremost that addiction, addiction to any substance is a disease. Uh, it is not, uh, we got a great question from a coalition member well, one time, how can we actually track uh, this, these, this, this problem as a disease and not as stigma. And I think it's a, it's a very powerful question, but it's one thing to remember uh, the dangers of this disease and what they mean when fentanyl runs into uh, people who may be subject to that. Uh, the economic burden uh, estimated to be $1.02 trillion at the national level, and this was just four years ago. It is much higher right now. We're looking at uh, healthcare, criminal justice, uh, and then we're looking at that against what it costs to actually make these substances. Uh, the cost of opioid use disorder is skyrocketing uh, on, and ongoing. Uh, and then we're looking at fatal overdoses, uh, which as Dr. Baldwin mentioned, uh, have really taken over the opioid uh, uh, crisis. They are due to the fentanyl and the cost uh, continues to climb. Um, the life, of course, is the strongest metric. And we do have those numbers. Uh, the context of the economic burden is not to take away from that, but it's a reminder of, of the resources that we have to bring to bear. Uh, and that includes uh, the resources uh, given to us from the CDC 
and from other partners, and we'll get to those in just a second here. Uh, if we look at fentanyl and primary prevention, what we've seen so far and what we're paying attention to in the presentation, uh, early recognition of those various analogs of fentanyl, that there are many different versions uh, and the chemical makeup can, be, can, can vary, uh, but we have to uh, recognize how quickly they can enter the community and share that information uh, from treatment, through healthcare, uh, through coalitions, uh, into the prevention world. Uh, in the next few slides, we'll talk about risk and protective factors, uh, looking at working across uh, different sectors, which is the bread and butter of coalitions, but also working across the seven strategies for community change. All of the practical theorists that we create, we try to include this part, uh, uh, this framework that was created uh, by CADCA, uh, when we look at working across individual strategies and working across uh, uh, environmental strategies, the research shows uh, these are what lead to success. Uh, first, let's look at those protective factors. Uh, we mentioned knowing more about fentanyl in our communities, uh, looking at those different versions, uh, recognizing how it can show up, how it can crop up in our communities, uh, how it can target those who are at risk, uh, those maybe suffering from uh, from addiction right now, and then identifying and working with key partners. And this is uh, more so than ever, uh, the chance for us to work with our partners in treatment. And then those risk factors, uh, marginalized and other at-risk persons and paying attention to how fentanyl is introduced uh, in a specific location. Uh, the, there's a lot of words on this, uh, uh, this slide and the next few slides. I don't want anybody to be discouraged. This is the content that's coming to you within the practical theorists, the seven strategies for community change. As coalitions are trained, and as we know, there are seven altogether, they are divided between individual and environmental strategies. A lot of coalitions struggle with the environmental strategies. They're gonna be a little harder to implement at the local level, uh, but we're gonna show a couple that should be, uh, that should help uh, coalitions to get a handle on this problem, and then what they can do uh, the providing information, uh, we talked a little bit about that, and then building skills, implementing some training programs uh, about uh, supporting and reinforcing those protective factors, uh, but also uh, providing healthcare, law enforcement, our sectors, uh, some training on handling and storage of fentanyl and recognizing those hot spots that pop up in, in different communities. Providing support, again, addressing those risk factors, reducing stigma, paying attention to uh, addiction as a, as a disease and how it does requ require uh, a, an ov a overall community effort. Not ostracizing persons, but actually reaching out to them and trying to get them into uh, treatment and learning from uh, what their experiences are. The environmental strategies, enhancing access and, re and reducing barriers, uh, include, uh, in includes increasing access and availability to, availability to services, engaging with partners, uh, paying attention to the use of fentanyl test strips and some other materials. Uh, none of these things are perfect, but these can be helpful to recognize, uh, to help others recognize what's in their hands and what they might be bringing into themselves that will likely result uh, in, their, uh, in, the, in an overdose. Uh, distribution of naloxone and disseminate training more widely. Uh, Dr. Baldwin mentioned this. Uh, being ready uh, when someone uh, is suffering in this way uh, to introduce something that can help save their lives. Uh, if it gets to that, uh, changing consequences and incentives, uh, providing incentives and changing uh, consequences related to prevention and response. And that means supporting initiatives for the quick identification, uh, reinforcement of a positive behavior to build resiliency, uh, especially for those that do feel marginalized, that do feel like they can't uh, deal with what's happening around them, uh, promote programs where youth can uh, share information uh, without uh, a feeling like they'll be uh, uh, ostracized or put aside or pulled in, uh, and then implementing Good Samaritan laws to encourage bystanders to alert uh, officials, especially first responders, uh, when an overdose is happening without fear of arrest, because sometimes these happen with people who know one another and friends. Changing the physical design, these are the two which are the hardest for coalitions. And we tried to get some uh, strategies in that would actually be helpful and doable and encourage coalitions to actually bring them into the work that they're doing. 
uh, training schools for enhanced class uh, classroom management, uh, development space, uh, safe spaces for persons that can potentially feel uh, marginalized, uh, and then changing the physical design that promotes inclusivity. Uh, we do know within our communities there are different places where people uh, use that are run down and and always apart and trying to make sure that uh, these uh, these places are, are taken away so that people uh, know that there are the community is present and there's support there as well uh, and then identifying places or hot spots where those deaths are taking place and getting alerts out quickly and then last policy uh, prescription drug control monitoring uh, at the state level uh, including uh, prescription fentanyl uh, and state systems for detection um, has been a fantastic program. We have some rock star states that are out there, especially Oklahoma with a five minute turnaround, local education policies, making sure it's clear, uh, working with different tools at the community level, including screening, brief intervention and referral to treatment, expert uh, in schools uh, with school-based health centers and in policies to support data sharing between first responders and other sectors. Uh, and don't forget those sectors. Don't forget healthcare. Don't forget uh, the power of healthcare and the knowledge of physicians and what they can bring and understanding what is happening with an overdose and what substances were at hand. Uh, education is always there. Terrific networks uh, at several levels uh, to actually share information. Of course, faith-based organizations uh, have uh, inroads to different communities and can really do strong outreach to marginalized groups. Public health, as we know, Dr. Baldwin showed us, public health knows data. Public health knows information. Your local public health and your state public health are gonna be strong partners for coalitions. And law enforcement knows full well, they can't arrest them with their, their selves out of, the way, out, out, out of this problem. We know that from Michael Botticelli, from the ONDCP, this has been the message uh, from our national partner. Law enforcement is there to help and law enforcement is there to make sure that as many people in the community uh, can be safe and avoid these dangerous substances. EMS professionals are the um, are the uh, in the dirt uh, workers here. They know what's happening and they see these things happening. They can provide training. They can give information about those hotspots. And we do need to pay attention to what's happening in the work that they're doing. Uh, business groups uh, can be some of the more robust partners that we have. Uh, they can actually help uh, with some organization and systematic efforts and then youth group, youth groups, uh, the youth and that education and working uh, with youth, letting them represent their communities. Uh, there's no better ambassador and we do need to highlight them as much as we can and integrate them in the work that we're doing. Uh, one important feature, uh, and I'll conclude my presentation, we're handing it over to uh, Marilee Fowler. Uh, there are a lot of support documents within uh, this practical theorist. Uh, there are a lot of URL links. Uh, we would not dream of making coalitions type in these URL links uh, directly from the practical theorists. So what we're going to do is we are going to uh, keep these links in there for online versions. Uh, we're going to point out uh, to point out to coalitions other tools that are available. Uh, the CDC has a terrific toolkit for first responders uh, responding to overdose spikes. Uh, and then there's also an opioid overdose toolkit from SAMHSA, uh, the president's report and the governors have a report as well. But what we're going to do is we're going to put them all in one place, uh, PDFs uh, that will be available just through this one simple uh, URL link. Uh, and anybody that has a print copy of this practical theorist will be able to access a PDF of these resources. Uh, there or links that will bring them directly to where these resources are located. I want to thank everyone for your attention. Thank you in Dr. Baldwin and now a real rock star, Marilee Fowler, uh, who works uh, as a member of the Coalition Advisory Council here at CADCA. Uh, she really is uh, fantastic and I think that uh, she'll have some good information for you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Trillian. Um, I just want to say how CADCA is just such a wonderful organization, and I don't know what coalitions across the nation would do without CADCA, so my hat's off to them for the amazing work that they do. I'm just really thankful for the opportunity to share with you some of the work that's being done in the state of Arizona with coalitions working together to address the fentanyl crisis in Arizona. 
And I wanna just start by telling you a little bit, of, we call it SACLA, Substance Abuse Coalition Leaders of Arizona, and how we got started because it was a grassroots effort. It was just an idea that we wanted to start every month getting, or excuse me, every quarter getting together with all the coalition leaders across the state and sharing ideas and talking about ways that we could work together on different substance use issues. So we first met in December, 2017. We had no funding, just all of us wanting to work together. Um, we came up with a mission statement that we're going to create collective impact to prevent youth substance use in Arizona and primary prevention, it, you know, we agreed that was gonna be our primary focus of what we were gonna be working on with the goal of that we could stop substance use before it starts. And so it doesn't have all the coalitions, but this is, just wanted to make sure that I gave a hats off to all of the wonderful coalitions in Arizona that are working on this project. But for us, you know, talking today about this very significant challenge of what is happening with fentanyl in our nation, for fentanyl in Arizona, it's been a complication for actually quite a while now. We identified in Yavapai County our first death from this illicit counterfeit fentanyl in 2016. And again, being a border state, I just heard a DEA presentation that so far in 2022, they have confiscated over 19 million pills just in Arizona of this counterfeit illicit fentanyl. And it's about 67% of the fentanyl that comes into Arizona. So we have been concerned about what we've been seeing and primarily because, and, and uh, Dr. Baldwin mentioned, you know, the age range of people that are dying. It's just been really alarming to see young people. In my county in 2020, there were five young people, two that were 14 years old, that died of this illicit counterfeit fentanyl. And if this is just kind of showing uh, from 2018 to 2020, the increase, again, these are teenagers that are dying of this illicit drug. So as preventionists, we wanted to be a part of the solution. And so we pitched a proposal to this, our state um, Medicaid and Medicare agency is called ACCESS. They, they're the ones that monitor our state opioid response dollars and said, would you give us some funding for all of us to work together to address this fentanyl problem? And we are just so grateful that they said yes to that request. And so what's been happening is there's 30, over 30 coalitions that are working to get together. We knew that we first had to develop the materials right and then get on the ground and be implementing. We wanted the first phase to um, talk to adults and parents. We, we knew the importance of that messaging. And so that was the first phase of our campaign. We were very fortunate to be able to do a statewide media campaign. I'm gonna show you some of the products with that, with TV, radio, and billboards. And then we wanted to expand what we had available for youth. I'm gonna talk about some of the things that we're doing in the schools hitting youth and then also young adults, college age students, or even if they aren't in, in college, the 18 to 24 year age, age category. We were also really grateful to get some money to do some other expansion coalitions and to develop a cycle stimulant toolkit. So this is just what the cover of our toolkit looks like. I'm gonna go kind of fast and furious, but I want you to know that every single thing that I have is available for you all. So don't worry about, you can, you can get anything that I'm showing today, but we, we gave it the title, Saving Lives by Moving Communities from Understanding to Action. We were all aware of the problem, but we wanted to be a part of the solution. And so we knew we needed to do it quickly. We had this time frame to develop and start implementing so, and to get everybody trained on the materials. So believe it or not, um, the funding came in um, in October and we were able to start implementing around January and February. So one of the things that we knew we needed to do was to talk to people outside of our coalition. So a requirement for the coalitions that wanted to participate was for them to do community forums. And I have this 27 community forums. That was the adult community forums that we did to gather some information from the general audience of their understanding of the problem. We later did community forums with youth and young adults, and we did 13 community forums with those age group um, individuals. So um, what we learned from the community forums, and I don't think this is any surprise to anyone, is that there was really a lack of awareness of what was happening with counterfeit fentanyl pills. We also realized that there was a lack of understanding and knowledge about naloxone education and awareness. There was a lot of talk about youth resiliency. Again, remembering that this was right when COVID was at a peak period, um, a lot of talk about youth resiliency, and then the concern about addressing stigma. Um, you know, we've heard today about this is a disease and a lot of times the shame and, you know, the stigma that goes with this is, is a huge part of our problem. So we wanted to address all four of these areas 
in what we were doing. So we actually built, set, developed work groups for each of the different categories that we were going to develop products. And we knew we had to talk about what are we going to develop. So the components of our toolkit, there's all sorts of print materials. Again, I'm going to show you just a few of them, but we have postcards, fact sheets, posters, a lot of information for parents on how to talk to your kids, um, door hangers. You're going to see some of these. We did a, a whole series of presentations so that we had, if we had an opportunity to go to a service club or to a church group or whatever it might be, that we would have set PowerPoint presentations on the, the one for adults we call the rise of fentanyl. Um, we developed one just focusing on social media and what is happening with kids accessing these dangerous drugs through Snapchat and other social media sites. We call that the new drug dealer in town. We did a presentation on the lock zone. Um, the, the media materials, you can read through that. We have, you're gonna, I'm gonna show you some of that. And then again, we knew the importance of talking to youth and being in our schools. So we developed a curriculum on um, fentanyl and also uh, talking about stress and resiliency. So, so I, I wanna spend, I know that one of the challenges for coalitions oftentimes is how do you get into the schools? How do you get administrators to you know, be a part of the solution? And so I just wanted to spend a little bit of time today um, emphasizing what we're doing and how we're partnering with schools in Arizona. And the first thing that we realized is we had to have conversations with the administrators. You know, sometimes it was the school boards or you know, the principals, the superintendents and the staff talking about what kind of a problem this was. Again, we realized that there was low awareness of what was happening with this fentanyl crisis in our, our state. Um, and we needed them to realize that they are a partner in this solution. So first of all, it was just having those conversations and sharing you know, some of the data that Dr. Baldwin gave, making people realize that, you know, again, kids as young as 14 years old are just taking that one pill and dying from this very dangerous drug. And the next thing that we realized is we needed to be creative and be flexible, right? Um, it's so important when we, we look at getting into the schools that I might have this, you know, six session curriculum that I think I'm going to walk in the door with. And wouldn't that be wonderful if that would be when they would allow me. But oftentimes they might say, hey, I have one classroom period or I really can't give you any classroom period, but I'm willing to do an assembly. So we knew that we needed to make a variety of materials for whatever opportunity that we had. And we knew that it wasn't just, again, the, the students that needed this education. It was the staff and the parents, the educators that needed to know about fentanyl and naloxone. And so a couple of the things that we did, and we needed to respond to their individual needs. Um, there's, I'm, I'm gonna talk about some of the things that we did around naloxone, um, but one of the things that we wanted all of our schools and the school nurse and other people at the schools to have naloxone. And so that was a very important thing for us. But one of the things that was a concern there, you talk about policy change, that they did not have a policy to have naloxone and they were concerned about that. So in the toolkit, a couple of the great coalition leaders worked on developing with, with some school administrators, a sample naloxone policy. So we could go to that school with that and say, here's a sample policy that you can take to your school board and, and make whatever changes that you would need. And the other thing is we wanted to make sure that we were providing all of these resources at no cost to the schools. This is the curriculum that we developed um, to be in the classrooms and we called it fentanyl a killer among us and that was actually we made sure that we always talked to youth with everything that we developed and they were the ones who helped us come up with this title but it's actually an interactive curriculum it's it's like an overdose fatality review board um, meeting in the classroom where we're talking about individual young people who have died from illicit counterfeit fentanyl and there's a, a workbook that goes with it and the kids are taking notes and and a big focus of it it's interactive talking about what would be solutions that would have prevented this death so um, we have been in front of um, tens of thousands of kids with this curriculum and we're very grateful for the schools for that i mentioned the importance that we had an option for more of an assembly type and some of you might have heard of this video i'm a big believer when there's a great resource out there get that resource if somebody's willing to share it, we don't need to reinvent. So there's a video called Dead on Arrival, which is about 21 minutes. That's just a very powerful video with parents who've lost their kids um, talking and very impactful. And so we've utilized that a couple, again, a coalition leaders developed a discussion guide to go with that. And so when we have an assembly, we can utilize this as a tool for the schools. When, when we talked to the kids in the focus groups, we learned a couple of things. And one of the things is that they 
you know, now we're seeing a lot of the colored pills, but primarily it was this M30 uh, blue pill and they called them blues. And so this is just the front of a postcard, which blue has a deadly dose of fentanyl. No one can tell that's geared towards youth and young adults. We wanted to make sure that there was always some takeaways. So get the facts at learnmoreaz.org. That's a website that we developed just for youth and young adults. And then to asking them to share this information with their friends. We also ran by the youth um, during the focus groups, several different taglines. And the one that they liked the most is fentanyl can end it all. So we utilize that in a lot of our print materials for youth. We have lots of different fact sheets, but I just wanted to show you a couple. Here's two versions of fact sheets that were developed just for youth with information, a little bit different designs. Um, we worked with youth and again, the coalitions to come up with multiple posters. We sent these out to all of the school districts across the state, the state, excuse me, and then each individual coalition that had relationships you know, brought them and there's this is just one version um, we made sure that we're using QR codes on everything for youth. We know that that's the way that they like to access information. So this is just an example of a poster that the schools could put up. Um, we developed, we, we, you know, I think, believe that Albert was talking about the importance of access to care in this very significant problem. And so this is a share because you care card or pass it on card. We have multiple versions. This one says you're worth it. But the purpose of this, the back is to have resources. We're so grateful right now that 988 is established where people can access um, you know, help through 988, but there's other, and we developed this you know, for each geographical area of Arizona, but the idea that the kids would have these cards and be passing those out. We also did a youth TikTok contest that we wanna keep building on. Uh, we did a water bottle sticker contest and had prizes for the kids that participated. Um, another thing that the kids told us is the importance of good animation. And so we have actually four different 15 second spots that the schools can use, you know, when they have uh, announcements or in social media, whatever, but I'm going to just share with you one of those. When you feel all alone, a pill can seem like it'll help you forget all your troubles or it could kill you because it might be laced with fentanyl. And remember, you're never really alone because there's always someone to reach out to. Learn more about the dangers of fentanyl at learnmoreaz.org. We also learned that they wanted to hear from youth. And so this is um, Eden. We were grateful to her willing to be, uh, be on this spot uh, talking about the death of her 14 year old brother, Alexander. Teens like me are dying from fentanyl poisoning. I know because I lost my brother Alex to one pill made with fentanyl. One pill can kill. It happened to my brother. It can happen to anyone. Fentanyl can end it all. And then just a success story from the schools. Uh, we worked with a mother that lost her 16 year old son, Ethan Sherry Duke. And she actually worked with the Arizona Department of Education to get fentanyl education up on their website. And we're really looking at ways that we can work with them moving forward to even have more of a push in the schools. So, so again, the website that we're referring youth to. Um, so I'm gonna hit a couple of the things for adults and caregivers um, that we work with. And this is, again, we're, we're made available to parents and educators through the schools. The website that we're referring them to is the Talk Now AZ. Um, but there's, there's a couple of lines here that, that you'll see over and over again. Uh, you know, Again, you see the one where it's, can you tell which pill has a deadly dose of, dose of fentanyl? Neither can your child. We wanna really hit home with the parents about kids accessing these drugs through social media. So did you know your child can connect to dangerous drugs through their phones? Having the three talk takeaways, one that is so important that we hit over and over is talk with your child about never taking a pill that's not prescribed to them and to monitor their social media and texts. And then a couple lines that I think were really important with this campaign, even if you don't think your child is taking pills, talking with them could be the reason they never do. So you'll see some of these messages over and over. Um, we have a variety of fact sheets for adults in both English and Spanish, for families, for the medical communities, for older adults. I talked about the young adults. We have made one just for the schools that we handed out to the schools and then a fact sheet for behavioral health. Um, the presentations I mentioned, this is the rise of fentanyl. That we made sure that they had, you know, they're, they're ready to go, that if you did spend enough time studying the PowerPoint, you could deliver it with, uh, again, good notes and different things, interactive videos in there. Um, we also, again, this is the one I talked about, the drug dealer in town, naloxone. That was so important to us that we take the time 
to educate our community on this very, very valuable resource. And so we, we developed a presentation. It's about 20 minutes that we can go to doing in services at the schools, community groups, just, you know, all of us are working really hard to get information out. And we're also distributors of naloxone so we can provide naloxone. When we hand out naloxone, we developed a card that we could give to people so that they would know how to administer and how to respond to an overdose death. The Good Samaritan Law has come up. That's something that was very important to us. I'm gonna skip through some of this. This is just social media. We have a whole host of social media posts. I'm gonna skip through. The next. Um, I'm gonna skip through that. But with, with the naloxone, uh, we called it Save a Life Campaign. And I just wanna uh, play this one. It's, it's a, a commercial radio spot that we did on naloxone. Young people in Arizona are overdosing at an alarming rate from counterfeit pills laced with fentanyl. But there's something you can do to stop an overdose from taking a life. Having the overdose reversal drug naloxone in your first aid kit could save your child, a friend, even a neighbor. Naloxone is easy to use. You don't need a prescription and anyone can administer it. And while it may not cost you a thing today, it could be the reason someone lives to see tomorrow. To learn more about where to find naloxone and how to use it, visit naloxoneaz.com. And that naloxoneaz.com website, that's another website we developed. It has an interactive map where they can click on it. And then the coalitions that are distributing naloxone in those areas will come up and we will get it to the end. I'm gonna skip that. I wanted to show you this one because the Good Samaritan Law, uh, we actually got a police officer, a retired chief to talk about, because in Arizona, we do have a Good Samaritan Law and wanted to make sure that people realize that. So I'm Deborah Black. I'm here to ask for your help to save lives during this opioid crisis. Individuals who have overdosed are being left to die because those around them are afraid to call for help. Arizona's Good Samaritan Law protects those who call 911 when they are present during an overdose. On behalf of law enforcement, please make that emergency call. You will not be arrested. You plus naloxone are a combination that will save lives in Arizona. So several other tools that we had in the toolkit talked about the Good Samaritan Law. Just really quick, the stigma. We have a whole component on stigma, a presentation, different things to hand out. Just again, making sure that people realize the many faces, you know, and it's a disease and that it, there were human beings that are struggling with this disease. I wanna show you this really quick. We were grateful to parents that were willing to share the story of losing their young people. And so this is a 30 second spot. We have longer versions that we inserted into some of our presentations, but this is Marissa talking about her son, Isaiah. Very, very, very sad. So let me Isaiah just was 15. He was in the middle of his sophomore year in high school. He just had this light about him. I get notification from a family member that there's a picture of Isaiah passed out. They're saying that he took a pill. You know, he went to go lay down and he just wouldn't get back up. We're pretty sure that your son ingested fentanyl and they're telling me he's not gonna make it. And I just told him like, you know, I love you. I love you no matter what. And you didn't deserve this. Learn more at talknowaz.com. Okay, we have lots of billboards. I'm clicking through these real quick, but we were very thankful to be able to put up billboards with the different taglines. When the colored pills came across, uh, we, we you know, pivoted and put out materials on that. So uh, different billboards, same danger, different colors with the fentanyl. And then we also have created you know, fact sheets and postcards and different things with these warnings on the colored pills. And so the impact for the evaluators, we're, we have a great evaluator that's helping us with both out, output and outcome data. And so uh, we're, we're in, you know, just success by the numbers. With our presentations, we've been in front of 23,000 people, distribute over 700,000 pieces of information, over 45,000 TV and radio spots. And part of that is because the Arizona Broadcasters Association took us on as a partner. So um, just really quick to end, I wanna talk very briefly about some challenges and how we overcame the challenges. The number one was the tight timeline. We didn't wanna take a year to develop these materials because we knew what a problem it was. I don't want to talk to another parent who lost their child. I don't want to. It's been devastating in our county seeing these deaths happen, and we knew we needed to go fast. And so we made the agreement that we were going to work together. We come from different communities, and we have different opinions, but we knew that we could develop a system of, to build consensus, and our goal was to save lives. And so we worked together with respect to have that happen. 
you know, the challenge of stigma. We knew that we could convince people that these are wonderful individuals that have a disease that are going down a path that nobody wants to go down and, and realize that it could happen to anyone. And then that idea of not my child, that was very important. Um, the, uh, the, most of the parents that did spots for us, they would have never dreamed it would happen to their child. So getting that out there and then convincing the schools that this is age appropriate information for their, for their students to learn. And so just overcoming some of those those barriers. And so how to access these materials, it, our website is saclaz.org. And I have only shown you just a tiny, tiny portion of what is in there. We have it where anybody can, it's a Dropbox system. You can download anything, use it how you want, change it how you want, um, take it, you know, anything that you think is of value. Um, once you click on it on the top of the, the website is a toolkit tab. And then it, at the bottom, there's a whole host of boxes but you can, one says elicit uh, fentanyl and counterfeit pills, naloxone, cycle stimulants, all sorts of things. And then after that, it'll open up in folders. And so I just encourage all of you, um, this is a devastating problem that we're all dealing with, but I know together we can solve it. We can make, you know, these deaths start going down and, and continue to save lives. And so I just am thankful to everyone here that's willing to learn more. And I hope that if there's any way that Arizona can help anyone out, we're happy to do so. So thank you for your time. All right, everyone. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much to um, our panelists for the wonderful presentations. Uh, just taking a look at the chat box, uh, I can tell that everyone is very, very impressed with um, all of your work, and uh, we're really very grateful to have everyone here um, be able to share that information with us. Um, so before we start off our Q&A here, um, I did prepare uh, two questions just to kind of kick off the Q&A, and so um, we have another about 25 minutes to be able to um, have the attendees ask the panelists any sort of questions or if they wanna um, ask them to elaborate on anything that they spoke about, this is your chance. And uh, I think it's really, really kind of valuable opportunity. So please take advantage of that. Uh, but just to start it off, um, first, I do wanna ask to all the panelists. So in your opinion, what is the biggest barrier to IMF, uh, illicitly manufactured fentanyl use prevention? And what can we do in our communities to address this? I can start off. Um, first, I, before we go there, I wanted to introduce Karen Betch, who leads the Drug-Free Communities Branch here at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She's probably well known to most of you, and she's going to join in for this conversation. I mean, I think raising awareness, which is part of what we're trying to do here, is absolutely critical. And then ultimately, not being naive about what needs to be done. So we need to continue to do the work of primary prevention and getting upstream. But as Marilei so I, I think so eloquently articulated, we need to be attentive to things like making naloxone more widely available um, anywhere and everywhere because of IMS presence um, in the illicit drug supply. So I agree with that. I think that it is a problem which requires uh, an effort from uh, several parts of the continuum of care. And I think this is where prevention does have to partner. Uh, the only thing I would add to it is uh, the federal government should appropriate more funding to the Drug Free Communities Program and for other programs that will help uh, stem the tide uh, with this problem. Um, there are there are some resources available. Uh, uh, Merrill Lee has fantastic resources. Uh, we tried to bring in uh, some resources with a practical theorist as well. Uh, use these materials and access them and build your understanding. And, and I'd like to just add one thing that I think is a real challenge. And I know that this is getting a little bit better as time has gone on. But a lot of people don't understand when you say fentanyl, they think prescription fentanyl. And that was a challenge that we had to really overcome, you know, and, and saying this is not prescribed by a doctor, you know, because again, we all went through it when we look, I tried to, uh, when we did address the prescription drug problem, that then there was that group of people that became scared to take a pain medication, even they, though they needed it. And fentanyl used properly by doctors is an amazing drug. I spent three, had three times I was in the hospital uh, not too long ago, and I was very thankful for that. 
you know, safely administered by a, a medical professional, but making people aware that that's not what we're talking about has been a challenge in this process. I would also add before on Justin, we go into the next question. I think we need to be attentive to the supply side issues. You know, the we cannot interdiction and the work of law enforcement to attend to the drug supply is also going to be absolutely critical here. So we need to be doing more, as Albert articulated, and I try to and Marilee try to articulate on the prevention side, but we need to work on the supply side as well. Okay, thank you so much for your answers. Um, and so just going on to the second question, and I know some of you have already addressed uh, some of these points here, but uh, what are some strategies and resources from your respective organizations that you would recommend coalitions to utilize? Um, again, uh, anything that you haven't already talked about, uh, we would appreciate it. I can start here as well, or Albert, do you wanna go first? I mean, one is the practical theorist. <laughs> um, it's about to come out. I, I, I'm I going to mention a couple of signature programs beyond the drug-free communities program that is so central, central to the work of this division at CDC. And the first is overdose data to action. So we fund 47 states and 19 big cities to do work um, across um, you know, both surveillance and prevention. I think there's some great opportunities for our coalitions to connect better and more intentionally, more thoughtfully to the work of overdose data to action. And this is a priority for Karen and her team um, there's a bunch of resources associated with OD2A that I think are, are, are important that, that can be very granular and specific to the work that's happening in your jurisdiction. The other is the overdose response strategy. We have done some great work um, uh, making stronger connections between public health and public safety. So we now have a drug intelligence officer and a public health analyst in all 33 HIDAs that covers 50 states, DC, Puerto Rico, the USBI, et cetera. Um, and there, that partnership is intended to do a couple of things, principally data sharing, but also sharing promising practices and programs. And so there's a, another opportunity because those DIOs and PHAs exist in all the HIDAs, an opportunity for the DFCs to connect directly to those uh, individuals and, and Karen and her team can make those connections uh, for you. But we also have a bunch of very practical resources. Let me mention just one that just came out last week, the public, and it was, uh, Albert highlighted it in his slides, the public health and safety uh, toolkit, which is basically, how do you get um, multi-sector, basically what coalitions are attempting to do, how do you get multi-sector groups of people co to come together to think about what's happening with the drug crisis in your area, to do something very intentionally and specific and hold each other accountable to be doing more, so it sort of builds on the work of, of the DFC coalitions, but really thinking in this case about overdose fatalities and what can be done differently. That, that FAST toolkit is absolutely fabulous, and it was just finalized last week. Um, and I think the Practical Theorist includes a bunch of, as Albert showcased, a bunch of other uh, really specific resources, dashboards that CDC recently came out with. So let me stop there. Uh, I could obviously go on and on. Part of, I mean, I really a central part of my job is to make sure um, data and resources are available to all of you. But let me turn it over to Albert and Marilyn. Well, I, I think it was very well said, and, and really it was a focus of the practical theorists to focus some attention on the work that's happening right now, uh, the work that's happening from the CDC because uh, the information, the data is essential, but also the work that's happening in coalitions like uh, like Marilyn Fowler's. You know, the one thing I would say, uh, Marilyn spoke to this, uh, but I want to emphasize it, uh, and that is, in our communities, uh, there are people that are uh, that are uh, excluded and left aside. And I would encourage us all, in addition to the coalition we're working and the systems work that we're doing, that we're remembering that this is a disease and that the people that are afflicted by this or maybe suffering are marginalized and they feel alone. And what can we do to help them ensure or feel that they're not alone and they're not by themselves? Um, sometimes it's a very daunting problem. It's a very intimidating problem. Uh, there are people that can help uh, with that increased understanding with reducing the stigma and to making sure there's support available uh, when you have big events like a pandemic uh, COVID or, or other uh, events uh, people can feel uh, out of sorts and feel like they're by themselves and I think we have to pay attention to that dynamic and pay attention to uh, the people within the community uh, that uh, may feel pushed away and make sure that doesn't happen 
And I'll just add, I think you, it's been said, but my go-tos, of course, are where the lead leaders on this call are, the CDC, CADCA, NIDA. You know, I'm always going to go to those experts and try to find resources and then, you know, again, see what changes I need to make for my community or if there's, you know, maybe gaps that we need to as a coalition develop. But I just, you know, encourage everyone, there's, there's a lot of great resources out there and it just takes, you know, looking for what's most effective for your community. All right, wonderful. So uh, I think we can start going to uh, some of the questions um, that we had in our Q&A box. Uh, first, I think, um, Ms. Karen, I think you had uh, flagged a question for the Q&A. Um, I think there was one question, and I think it, it's popped up in the Q&A. Again, I'm going to pass it to Grant. There has been some um, there have been some um, anecdotal reports about marijuana or cannabis being laced with fentanyl. So I'm gonna pass that one to Grant. Um, and uh, because I know that um, uh, we have heard that also during some calls about anecdotal reports. So I wanted him to address that first question. So I think it's more myth than not, uh, but the reality is that anytime you're getting drugs in an illicit marketplace, you you know sort of, you can't, you can't presume that the drug you're taking is exactly what it was described sold to you as so i mean i think the short answer is um you know i don't think it's uh it's not commonplace um and certainly obviously not in the regulated marketplace that exists in many states or increasingly a large number of states now but it's not something that i would simply dismiss that if you purchase uh, marijuana on the on the illicit market that you can simply presume that it doesn't contain um fentanyl so it's a it's kind of a word of caution, but the data don't necessarily support it um, in a wide scale basis at this point. All right, awesome. Um, and I think there are a couple of questions specifically for uh, Ms. Marilee Fowler in the Q&A box. Um, so we'll share the uh, resources um, after the presentation out in email. Um, and for the general questions, let's see. Uh, how much are you seeing young people choosing to use fentanyl, not just taking fake pills, was one of the questions. That's such a good question. And I'm going to answer this more from um, Dr. Baldwin talked about overdose fatality review. And I actually, in our county, we have an overdose fatality review board. So with the you know young people that have died, um, we've taken a good deep look. And what, what's interesting is I it, it's a mixture is what I'm going to say. Um, we know situations where, we, uh, you know, there's a, a college student that takes a Xanax. They think they're taking a Xanax and it was illicit fentanyl and they die. So that definitely is a percentage of the young people. But we've had, we had, the, uh, when I mentioned the 14 year old, we actually, when we did that case review, actually got to see his phone messaging and he was telling his friend, I just took a fentanyl pill. He knew it, but, and he had struggled, you know, with, using marijuana and some other drugs before that. And he, you know, he was telling him that he couldn't breathe. So I think that it's a combination. I think that there's not, I can't, you know, from my experience, it's not just one story. It's a mix of people that, young people that have no idea that it's a fentanyl pill that they're ingesting. And those that, you know, maybe have even struggled a little bit with a use disorder and know it's fentanyl. So it's a combination. And I don't know, if, Dr. Baldwin, if you could answer that better than me, but that's just from my um, what I know in, in our area. No, I think that was a great answer. And I think once you've been exposed to fentanyl and have developed some tolerance that um, a couple of other points about fentanyl has a very short half-life in your body. So you need to, you know, um, your body processes it pretty quickly. And so you're having to um, use fentanyl uh, more so than you would other opioids. So that's an important point. And once you developed, um, um, once you started using fentanyl, it's, it's you know, very difficult um, and that's why you need to work with uh, trained professionals as you, um, uh, once you develop a use disorder to, you know, uh, go on medications for opioid use disorder to sort of manage your use disorder because fentanyl is so potent. So it, it does, in fact, become sought after. And we do know that fentanyl has replaced heroin altogether in some markets, um, some illicit markets across the country. So um, it's, it can be both sought after and it's almost um, so prolific as well. All right. Um, and then we have another question um, about addressing some of the myths uh, associated with fentanyl. And so uh, you had already addressed uh, marijuana 
in fentanyl, Dr. Baldwin, but another question was about um, whether people can overdose just from touching or testing drugs or fentanyl. I mean, any exposure to, I mean, any ingestion of fentanyl can be dangerous. So um, I think there's a, a little bit of a myth. Um, and one of the things that we want to guard against for first responders and others um, responding to the scene of a person who's overdosed about their own personal risk of, of, uh, of exposure. So uh, the, the risk is not zero, but I certainly, I don't think that should prevent people from acting and saving a life uh, with naloxone. Alrighty, and uh, I'll go back to some of the specific questions for Ms. Marilee Fowler. Um, uh, someone asked if you could share discussion topics with uh, the attendees for Dead on Arrival, uh, because they're looking to show um, that video to parents and high school students in the new year. Uh, another question for you is what age group of youth does the SACLAS curriculum focus on? I'll answer the second one first. So we've been using the specific curriculum that we developed at Killer Among Us for, for middle through and high, middle school and high school. So, you know, we can change a little bit of the content to be more age appropriate, but those are the, the, the age range that we've been implementing that in the schools. Um, for the, the second question about dead on arrival, I just would encourage you to watch it. It's only 21 minutes. And so it really just hits home, you know, different situations where people have died uh, from the drug and it, it's very emotional. It's very emotional. We, it, it just, it, it brings good discussion. That's, you know, in my experience with it, it just really facilitates some good discussions with the youth that watch it. So I just would encourage you to just take the 21 minutes and watch the video. You, it's on YouTube. If you put it in, it'll come up and, and they allow people to use it, so. If, if I could add just very quickly, when, we're, when we see <clears throat> Dr. Baldwin, I think, addressed the, the questions uh, very well. Uh, that there's a lot of stories. There are a lot of things that are out there which are startling and they're scary. And this substance is, and you just, just the regular numbers, uh, will really set us back on our heels. And it'll, it'll create a feeling of, well, what in the world can we do? Let's throw our hands up and let's bury it all and put it aside, not worry about it. And hopefully the information that's coming from this webinar from what Dr. Baldwin's giving and from Marilee's giving you should uh, help uh, ensure that we're not intimidated by this and we're not scared to take action. And I think what, what Marilee's talking about, uh, the emotions and, and, and confronting this and, and some of the, uh, the bad stories uh, should make us uh, shy away. They're supposed to help us lean into this problem because really coalitions are the answer for this. Justin, why don't I take one of, there's a couple of questions about xylazine, which is an animal yes. tranquilizer deaths that, um, you know, they increased xylazine, you know, it, uh, fentanyl's laced into xylazine. Um, and the question about sort of, is it, is it sort of restricted to the Northeast Philadelphia, for example, saw it go from around 2% of overdose deaths to a third of opioid overdose deaths included xylazine. Let me first mention that one of the programs that we fund as part of overdose data to actions called suitors or the state unintentional drug overdose reporting system. Part of the benefit of that system is they get full toxicology and all um, unintended drug overdoses. So we have information about all the drugs on board at the time of death. Um, I posted in the chat um, some a couple of notes from the field. Um, one from Connecticut, one more recent one from Cook County in uh, the Illinois and the Chicagoland area. So I think the short answer, it is becoming more widespread. Um, and as was pointed out in the chat, the, the challenge is it doesn't necessarily respond to um, naloxone because it's not an, um, an opioid. And so you really need, I mean, part of the response is part of the response when you arrive at the scene of a suspected overdose, if you're a bystander, is to administer naloxone, but obviously immediately call 911 to make sure that uh, emergency medical staff can be there on site as quickly as possible. All righty. Um, we have another question here about, um, so I'll just read the question out for um, the panelists here. Some places, Australia, for example, have pill testing sites, which allow for testing of substances and let people know if the pills contain anything unexpected. Is this provided or being discussed here? 
Yeah, so um, in April of last year, OD2A dollars for the first time could be used to purchase fentanyl's test strips. Um, so they, you know, um, but again, there are some, um, you know, fentanyl test strips are not the panacea, so they don't necessarily come back positive for um, fent some of the fentanyl analogs. So you need to interpret cautiously um, the, the results of um, the use of a fentanyl test strip. So they can be, uh, distributed in, you know, through mobile outreach and in communities directly or through, you know, drugs can be tested at harm reduction um, sites as well. I would, I would just add that, and I think, you know, referencing um, Dr. Baldwin's presentation about the chocolate chip effect and just the practicality of fentanyl test strips, um, with, uh, I think, this age group, in addition to the fact that many of them may be exposed to it through pills, it might be a certain number of pills. Um, the idea, you know, the fentanyl test strips, I think, should be kind of viewed with caution in terms of an ability to really address the problem because you do, um, I think, in practicality, have to actually crush the pill in order to test it. Um, you do have, it's, it's not guaranteed that that fentanyl is going to be distributed equally across maybe the two to three pills that a young person might get perhaps over the internet. So, um, while I think fentanyl test strips have been, um, a remarkable tool, it's just, it just with some caution and thinking about uh, the audience, the age group, the method through which they are accessing fentanyl. Um, so just keep those things, um, in mind. Yeah, I think that's a great insight, Karen. Let me amplify one key point that you were making. That is, you know, a negative doesn't mean the drug is safe. So, you know, that, that's just absolutely critical to reinforce. You know, I think one of the considerations, not only for fentanyl, but for any uh, substance which is uh, not prescribed or which is not regulated in some way, uh, we don't know what's in anything. We don't know THC levels in marijuana. Uh, if there are labels, the labels are likely incorrect. We don't know what's in uh, an illicit, illicitly manufactured pill. We don't know. And, and so certainly if we can find out, we should. Absolutely we should. Uh, and I think uh, Karen and Dr. Baldwin are, are, are really spelling out uh, some of the issues here, but really the messaging piece here uh, for, for anything is that we just don't know. And, and, and what do you do with something that you don't know? And so that's gonna be a, an important tool uh, just to communicate, just for the uh, knowledge sharing that can happen uh, between coalitions and sectors. Yeah, I see Lori just posted something up in the chat. I think she's right. I mean, they are one of the tools that can be used and you know, any tool is better than no tool. So it's just another tool in the toolbox. So great to see that there's great demand there, frankly, great receptivity to their use, um, but wanted to sort of reinforce the point of sort of how they should be used um, in complement with other harm reduction strategies. Um, Justin, I also wanted to address one of the questions that came in about, um, you know, kind of effective early interventions program, intervention programs for young people who may be using you know, other substances and therefore perhaps a gateway to um, to the use of perhaps the more potent or more illicit substances. So I think that, you know, again, the, you know, I just wanted to reiterate the importance of primary prevention, the importance of, of you know, kind of some of the, the bedrock of, of, the, of the activities and, and the foundational activities that coalitions engage in are still so vitally important when it comes to um, the primary prevention for substance use. I think what we are seeing in the, in the, in the marketplace and in the reality, it's, it's like a yes and, like you have to continue to focus on those primary prevention pieces. Let's not forget about those kind of underlying issues that might um, influence or um, a, a young person to use substances, some of those risk and protective factors that coalitions are so great at kind of addressing and focusing on. And at the same time that we are also a drawing attention to this issue, people are aware that they understand the risks that they are talking about about these issues. So um, I think there are a number of different programs, you know, life skills is one of them. I think that a number of coalitions are, are um, 
you know, are familiar with in terms of kind of that training resilience skill building among youth that can be embedded into a number of our systems where young people are. Um, but we should, but at the same time, right, drawing attention to some of these kind of the, the immediate in addition to the long term. So I just wanted to address that issue as well. All right, wonderful. Um, so we're just gonna do one last question before we wrap up here. Uh, this is for uh, Ms. Barely, I believe. Um, they asked, did your Arizona middle school youth have high misuse of prescription drugs as a risk factor in years before you saw use in depth from fentanyl? fentanyl. Um, I'm very excited to tell you that our uh, use, our misuse of prescription medicines for our youth has gone down considerably. Like in our county, it's like 1.3%, and that's 8th, 10th, and 12th. I, I don't remember exactly what it is just for the 8th graders, but we have the Arizona Youth Survey that is done. If I go back to like 2010, that number was up about 15%. So I'm very excited that that number has gone down significantly in our state. I hope I answered. Is that Did I answer that, Justin? Sounds good to me. All right. Um, so I think uh, just to be respectful of everyone's time, I want to wrap up here. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, we will be distributing these slides to those of you who participated following uh, the webinar. And the email will contain a short evaluation for the webinar. So please fill it out um, to receive a letter of participation. Uh, again, everything will be posted, uh, the recordings and the slides on uh, CADCA's Research Into Action uh, websites. And um, yeah, a huge thank you to Dr. Trillian, Dr. Baldwin, uh, Ms. Fowler, and Ms. Karen also uh, for your wonderful comprehensive presentations uh, on your respective works and your commitment to providing uh, relevant and current material. Uh, you know, this presentation especially was so timely and important. And so, uh, you know, thank you so much for your time today. And thank you again to the webinar participants for your comments, questions, and insights. Alrighty, thank you, so well, thank, thank you so much everyone. Have a great one.